Hello, my name is Jacob Neal. I'm the son of Jordy Neal, who owns this podcast. And I am grateful for Jonathan Mooney for making a book that inspires people with ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia to keep on moving even when it's hard. And thank you for the dads for helping the kids get through hard moments. Happy Father's Day. Hi, and welcome to Mother's Quest, a podcast for moms like me ready to live our own truly epic life. I'm Julie Neal, a life and leadership coach, community builder, writer, and mom to two high energy boys who challenge me to grow into my best Whoa! self. Hello and welcome to this year's special Father's Day episode with Jonathan Mooney, an amazing father who is also a dyslexic writer, speaker, activist, and self-described do-gooder. Jonathan didn't learn to read until he was 12 years old, was told he would be a high school dropout and end up in jail, but instead forged a path to Brown University where he co-founded an organization and co-wrote a book to help neurodivergent students like himself succeed in college, all on the way to graduating with an honors degree in English. He's since become a champion for neurological and physical diversity for more than two decades, and his award-winning advocacy projects have been featured in major media outlets, including the New York Times and Los Angeles Times, HBO, NPR, Fast Company, and many others. Before I share some key takeaways from this episode, I want to introduce another incredible neurodivergent parent of neurodivergent children who is a powerful advocate, coach, and trainer on systems, executive functioning, inclusion, and accessibility, and who has been a tremendous support to me and my son, Ryan, Briar Harvey. Here's Briar. Hello, my name is Briar Harvey, and I am so excited to be here to dedicate this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast on fatherhood to my husband, Brett Harvey. Not all of us get the most ideal childhoods or the perfect parents, and sometimes we have to do the work to grow and change to be the parents that we wish we had had. So. This episode is in honor of my husband and the work that he has done and the work that I do and that we continue to do every day when it comes to neurodiversity and empowering our children. Thank you so much. And I am so excited for this episode. Thank you, Briar, for this dedication to your husband and for reminding us all that the work of understanding, embracing, and advocating for our children is ongoing. This theme is one we explore deeply in this conversation, beginning with the powerful story of Jonathan's own mother and how she inspired him to reframe his language and his thinking about his differences. In this episode, Jonathan goes deep and wide about his quest to help himself and others with differences understand they are not deficient. He helps us think in new ways about disabilities and understand how systemic change can not only make our world more inclusive for people with differences, but through universal design, make things better for everyone. You'll want to listen to this episode with a pen and paper. Prepare to rewind and listen again as I did at various points. And then get ready for a part two with Jonathan and my neurodivergent son, Ryan. He's off to college in the fall and eager to learn from Jonathan, not only about how he can thrive, but also about how he can use his voice for advocacy to help make his university more inclusive for all. I hope you enjoy this first of two with Jonathan Mooney and have a wonderful Father's Day. I'm Julie Neal, and this is Mother's Quest. Jonathan, welcome to the Mother's Quest podcast for this special Father's Day edition. I'm so honored and excited to have this time with you. Oh, I'm uh, 
super honored and really excited to chat with you. I was telling you that I often set intentions with my guests before we press record, but I really wanted to bring the intention setting to what we share. I first of all want to just, I want to acknowledge Julie Lithcott Hames right out of the gate. She and I had an interview on the podcast and I invited my son, Ryan, who's a neurodivergent and it was a transformational conversation for him. And in the midst of that conversation, you know, she said, have you ever heard of this book from Jonathan Mooney called Normal Sex? And Ryan said, I haven't, but I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie sent him the book and he began reading and we learned even more about you. I think I had heard you speak as well previously. So I knew some about your journey and it planted the seed immediately for wanting you to come on the show. So my intention partially is, you know, to build on the seed that Julie planted, but also I was telling you that my son was listening to me prepare for the conversation. I was listening to Debbie Reber interview you, you on her Tilt Parenting podcast, which is such a great resource. And he said, oh, man, I really want to talk to this guy. He's got a senior event that he had to get on a bus to go to today. And so he could be here for the interview. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to ask if we can do a two-part conversation and have you talk with Jonathan about getting ready to go to college. And you said yes. So my intention in this conversation today is to really hold space for you to share your story and your journey and then know that we're going to have this opportunity to delve even deeper into what you have to offer to young people like my son, Ryan. What's your intention? Well, well, I mean, first of all, I, I don't mean to correct you on your own show, but I think when you presented the opportunity to talk with your son in part two, my response was, uh, the hell yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a few other impolite things to say in, in, <laughs> on a radio show. I couldn't be more honored to be a part of your contribution to the world and to talk with your son. And I don't really have an intention in the sense of, of something that I want to make sure we cover or put out there in the world. I have a core mission I'm on, and that, and that mission is to make sure that young folks who deviate from the cultural construct of normality don't feel deficient and are not demeaned. And so anyway, our conversation can advance that message. I'm down with it. So wherever you want to take it, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> I know I know we will get to all of those amazing places. So well where we begin, I know is going to be a very resonant place for you, which is I would love you to tell me a little bit about your own childhood and the impact that your mother had in shaping who you are today. You know, I was in many ways, not all, but in many, the sort of square peg that did not fit the round hole. Certainly true in my educational experience, but also true in my sort of family dynamics my mom, who I'll speak more about in a second, you know, her parents, Irish immigrants, and she grew up with them sort of clean and rich folks houses up in San Francisco. She got involved in radical politics in the Bay Area in her late teens and her formative years of being a young adult. And my father, on the other hand, persistent substance abuser, alcoholic, genius, uh, <laughs> which kind of go hand in hand often. And we had a lot of economic insecurity. So that was the sort of broader family dynamics. And then school was just a shit show. <laughs> you know, there's no other polite way to say it. Uh, I was a kid that couldn't sit still. So I spent a lot of the day chilling out with the janitor in the hallway. I was the kid who couldn't keep his mouth shut. So I was good friends with Shirley, the receptionist in the principal's office. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a kid who 
who struggled with reading and writing. So I spent a lot of the day kind of hiding in the bathroom to escape reading out loud. I generally got the message that my differences were deficiencies inside of me. There were many reasons I could resist that message, but my mom in particular is reason number one through 1,000. Because <laughs> mm. without her, I would have capitulated to the idea that I was stupid, crazy, lazy, and, and who knows where I would have ended up. Wow. I have begun reading your book, Normal Sex, which is incredible. And your mom is very present in it from the get-go. I was so struck by the story that you tell in there about where the title of your book, Normal Sex, emerged. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, the subtle title, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you it's know, pretty I, epic, that title. I, I figured, why beat around the bush? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I think of the title as a, as a gift to fellow folks who, who struggle with reading. So you don't really got to read the book. You can just sort of look at the title. <laughs> <laughs> You can have the title read out loud to you by like uh, any number of text to speech <laughs> technologies, and you kind of you kind of got it. <laughs> That's it, you know. Yeah, look, my mom was the first person to really challenge what is a much broader cultural and systemic message that people who deviate from normal get, and that message is not that you're different, but that you're deficient, that you're a problem in some way. And that sort of systemic and cultural value of, of normalcy manifests itself in, in many ways. But first and foremost in my life and in the life of, of many neurodivergent human beings, it raised its head in being diagnosed, right? Like even that sort of framework of diagnosis, which is a medical phenomena of diagnosing a disease. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be sort of understanding a difference, but nonetheless, it's sort of entered into from a pathology perspective is one of those places where we start that different as deficient discourse. And so I remember when I was diagnosed, I was nine, the test results came back and me and my mom were called into the school psychologist's office. The moment me and, and mom got into the office, it was just like obvious that everybody was very much steeped in that pathology model. You know, everyone sort of felt that we were getting terrible, tragic news as a result of the diagnosis. The lights were turned down low in the office. There was like jazz music playing in the background. Uh, there was, and I really kid you not, a box of tissues on the table, right? Because everybody thought we were there to mourn the, the death of my normality. They proceeded to read from the test results, you know, and it was all negative deficit this, executive functioning disorder this. I remember walking out of the room with my mom and uh, I turned to my mom and I go, hey, mom, am I normal? She looks right at me and she says, normal sucks. <laughs> she was right unfortunately like many things your parents tell you it took me a long time to realize she was right <laughs> but nonetheless it's not a way to live and it's certainly not a concept to build school or society around and that message of you're not the problem the problem is this idea that we should all be the same that message really saved my life. Well, I told you before we pressed record that I brought a tissue box because I could just tell already this conversation is going to be emotional for me. But, you know, I'm just really inspired by your mom. I aspire to be like her. And, you know, I have two neurodivergent kids. My oldest, Ryan, is autistic and highly gifted. And then I have a nine-year-old. Jacob. And we discovered that he has ADHD when he was quite young, four. But then in the summer going into second grade, we discovered that he's also dyslexic and has dysgraphia. 
even though I've been now doing this work and on my own journey of discovery and learning and shifting my perspectives, I still find myself looking at things from a deficit angle and confronting my own ableism. I think this is an ongoing quest and mission of my own to be able to see my children with all their difference and all their brilliance. So thank you for sharing the story of your mom. I'm gonna really carry that moment of clarity that she had with me as I continue to parent. Well, you know, I think we all need to have empathy for ourselves because that institutionalized and cultural ableism, it's so deep and it's so embedded in how we think, how we define human value, how we define success as a human being, as a parent. It's heroic work to try to extricate oneself from it. And that work is ongoing. And it's one step forward, couple steps back kind of work. But it's essential work. It does start with how we talk, because how we talk informs how we think. And if there's something that I am most inspired by within the last, I would say, almost less than two years is the elevation of a neurodiversity framework opposed to a pathology framework. Because that notion of different being deficient and that idea that things that deviate from the statistical middle of the bell curve are less than, that is embedded in entire disciplines of knowledge. And then it's embedded in entire disciplines of practice around psychology and psychiatry, and then the whole subset of educational disciplines around rehabilitation, special education, etc. We're pushing against a, a long history, and we're pushing against a tsunami of professionals telling us something wrong with us and our kids. And it's been frontline activists like your son, like you, like folks in the autistic autism community that have said, no, different isn't deficient. It's a form of diversity. It, do we dismiss the challenges? No, of course. Look, I spell at a third grade level. I got the attention span of a gnat. I get the challenges, but it's still a valuable form of diversity that has something to contribute to the world and it needs to be celebrated opposed to pathologized. I want to use this as a jumping off point to get into what I call the epic guideposts. So I know you've been learning a little bit about Mother's Quest. I say that I'm on a quest to live my epic life and that's the kind of life where I'm the author of my story and I'm really pursuing the things that matter most to me. So when I look back on my life, I feel like it's filled with meaningful challenges and the stories I want to tell to my grandchildren someday about the ways that I really showed up and continue to grow. But EPIC is also an acronym mnemonic for the guideposts that I think help us to live that kind of life when we're raising our kids. And so I'm going to ask you some questions about each of the guideposts to better understand how these show up in your life and the lessons you've learned around them. The first guidepost E stands for engaged mindfully with our kids. And I know that you're both a father yourself and you have also done a tremendous amount of work talking and working and advocating with and for young people. I would love to hear how you look at what sometimes feels to me like this tension between seeing differences as something of value and not a deficit and also acknowledging that some of these things are a disability so you already started to allude to like there are real challenges but I feel this tension with my kids where Ryan's really working to try to embrace himself and tackling like this internalized ableism that can lead to some kind of a lack of self-compassion a lot of the time but he also keeps saying, but I do have a disability. Like these things are hard for me. I need different things. And I'm also thinking about my younger son who has the privilege of going to a special school for kids who are dyslexic, which has been a real gift. 
And at that school, they talk about dyslexia as a superpower. During distance learning, he was like throwing things at the screen <laughs> and yelling. He was on mute on Zoom yelling, it's not a superpower. Like it really pissed him off because he's still experiencing it as a real challenge. So I'd love to hear how you've handled this in your life with your kids and with the other young people that you work with. As you noted, mentioned, I got three boys. Uh, <laughs> I got a 15-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old. I know their names, but don't ask me their birthdays. I can give you like my oldest birthday and then my middle boy, I can give you like the quarter of the year, like somewhere <laughs> in September through October. But the third one, I, I don't know. He could be 14 for all I know. I have no idea. So, uh, so, the, so the third one, it always gets for, I'm the third. There aren't very many baby pictures of me, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so look, if you want a, a crash course in the reality of human difference, have multiple children, right? Because uh, <laughs> we got the same genetic combo going on and the outcome is, is so different. And it's a deep reminder uh, for me, and I've been at this for 22 years, and so I am still struck by the reality of human difference opposed to the myth of human sameness. And parenting my children bring that to the fore for me every single day. And that pillar of mindful engagement is such a profound insight in how we parent, but how we, or how I, try to be a human in the world. And as it pertains to this different versus disability conversation, the way that that mindful engagement shows up in my parenting is to constantly be checking myself and asking myself the question, am I seeing the child, my child, my son in front of me through the lens of who I think they should be or am I seeing them for who they are? And that sounds like kind of a simple thing to say, but it's really hard to do. It's really hard to constantly be checking yourself to be conscious of the value filters that you're seeing the world through. Many of which are unconscious, many of which are habit, not mindfully chosen. And so look, I work at that every single day at every single journey on the parenting and it changes all the time. Am I seeing them for who they are or who I think they should be? And holding myself accountable to the times in which I failed at that and keep trying that, I think for me is, is the mindfully engaged parenting practice that I try to bring to our family. Now, to your question of different disability, I want to be clear with folks, I have significant challenges. Like I flippantly said, I, I spell at a third grade level. I do. That's a real thing. I confuse words that look alike. I still struggle with reading. Who and how look the same to me. Horse and house look the same to me. I mean, I swear to you, when I went to college, I thought my college, Brown University, I thought they, uh, offered a course in orgasmic chemistry. <laughs> but they should. <laughs> Imagine my disappointment on the first day of that class. So look, oh I get, there are neurobiologically based and for our brothers and sisters with physical differences, physically based deficits and challenges. Those are real. The flip side of that is one, what goes hand in hand with those neurobiologically based challenges and weaknesses and deficits are a whole bunch of good things. And those good things are equally as neurobiologically based and present when fMRIs are done 
And when we look at the life outcomes of neurodivergent human beings. Now, the next thing I'd say is not only do we have to be able to walk and chew gum and say, look, here's some real challenges and here's some real strengths and gifts. Let's not be naive about either. The other thing for me is where do we locate disability? Historically, we've put disability inside of people, right? So we've taken a value of normality or average. We've applied that and designed our systems around it. And then if you deviate from normal, you're abnormal and you're the problem. And we put the problem in people. And that's percolated and lived in a whole bunch of sort of power knowledge disciplines. But what if we reframe the problem? What if we thought of it as the problem, not in the person, but in the interaction between person and context? So let me take that abstract sort of reframe and make it real in my life. Look, ADD, a difference, a challenge, not my problem. My problem was the school desk. My problem was a system designed around the myth of the passive learner, where on average, 80% of the day, kids sit still and passively receive information. Mm. That was really my problem. So I think of it this way in my life. And I got to acknowledge that this framing really comes from critical disability theory. It's not my framing. And the framing is that I don't have a disability, but I experience disability in contexts that cannot embrace or include the reality of human embodiment. Wow. And the reality of human embodiment is that we're all temporarily abled bodies. At some point, we will all experience disability in our life cycle. So that notion of, of reframing the problem doesn't dismiss the challenges and weaknesses that come with neurodivergence or with cerebral palsy, with autism or Down syndrome. What it says is that those are manifestations of human difference with challenges and good things about them. They become disabled by social constructs and social system behavior that does not value or include those differences. And why I'm so excited about that reframe is that it puts our onus of change, not on ourselves, but on the system around us. And it says, you know what? We got to change the desk, not the kid. We got to get rid of the reading groups, not dyslexia. We have to reimagine a system around universal design opposed to the myth of universal human sameness. Ooh, okay. I feel like you're already like blowing my mind. I often say this. There are parts of interviews where I know I'm going to go back and listen to that same thing like multiple times. There's so much depth and so much power in what you're saying. And I also can't wait to share it with Ryan. I want to now jump to the second guidepost P, which is about passionate and purposeful impact. And this is the impact that you're making in the world beyond your family. And you've already said what you're on a mission for, and you've, you've begun talking about the work that you do. But I'd love to now leap further into this idea of changing systems and here you know, in terms of your impact right now, how are you finding the path to make these kinds of systemic changes? Yeah, look, that system change work is hard work. It's all hands on deck work, meaning it's not me. It's not the famous speaker. It's not one person, but all of us together. And I think that's really important to explicitly name because I think we're in a moment of real opportunity and the more that we recognize that your son, a student who has never written a book or never given a TED talk, their voice matters and in some ways matters more than these voices that are elevated above them. I think it's important for us to, to seize that moment. So when it comes to my contribution to that moment, for me, the work starts with being a, an intellectual, for lack of a better word, advocate for a new way of thinking because the way that we think determines how we act. And when we sort of think with frames and language that we 
inherited from eugenics. I mean, let's be real for a minute. You know, this notion of the normal human being emerged in the late 19th century. It was intrinsically linked with scientific racism, scientific homophobia, scientific sexism, in which the disciplines of psychology, psychiatry, and medicine, and pseudo evolutionary theory were all being used to discredit entire swaths of human beings as abnormal and justify discrediting human beings in that way with the notion that this is scientific or objective. And so it's so hard to extricate ourselves from that intellectual tradition because it's in the DSM. We forget as a culture that the Bible of modern psychiatry pathologized and called homosexuality a mental illness until the late 70s. I mean, we forget that, right? And so we need to think different because it leads us to acting differently. And so in whatever way I've tried to contribute to that thinking differently, you know, this stuff that I just told you, you know, that has sort of, you know, maybe a kind of an abstract bent, maybe a little bit of an academic history, you know, I share this with kindergartners, you know, because Mm -hmm. they get it, you know, like, hey, it ain't the desk, it ain't you, it's the desk. So I try to contribute in our thinking differently, that can lead to acting differently. I also try to contribute in building community and pride, you know, and I use that latter word with real intentionality, meaning I understand its historic roots in the LGBTQ plus movement, the black power movement, which was a pride movement. We need that, you know, that's a fundamental social justice tool that allows communities to resist being pathologized and marginalized by building a sense of pride in who they are. So, you know, back in the day when I was an undergraduate college, you know, I co-founded an organization called Eye to Eye, which is still in existence to this day. And run by the first mentor of that organization, great advocate, amazing thinker, good friend named David Flink. And that organization is all about community and pride for folks with neurodivergence. We need more of that. That's a core part of sort of acting differently to create those communities and sense of you're not deficient, you're different. And then last thing I'll say on the acting differently, you know, I'm out there trying to advocate for universal design. You know, we have designed our systems, our places of work, our schools, our built environment around the idea that we're all the same. And we have an opportunity to redesign, reimagine our systems, our places of work, where we learn around the reality of human difference. And the universal design movement is making real traction and real contribution in schools all around the country. And I support and amplify the work of the universal design movement wherever and whenever I can. That's so powerful. Can you give the actual definition of universal design? So universal design, it takes as its core approach, the idea that we differentiate instruction or our built environment to create access to opportunity, education, employment for the continuum of brains and bodies that we know are paradoxically typical. So that's the mission of universal design. It gets applied within education settings, where then the work is all about creating access to learning by changing the environment through technology, through presentation of information, through different pedagogical approaches other than sort of sit and get approaches. It gets applied to the work environment. And one of the things that I've been contributing to over the last two years is supporting the idea of neurodiversity in the workforce and creating practices and processes within employment settings that are universally designed. And then obviously it gets applied to the built environment, sometimes called inclusive design, as we start to build our communities, our homes. Let's embed some of those things that we think about as accommodations for disabilities. And let's reframe these things we think of as accommodations as really universal design strategies. Because the person who 
benefits from the curb cut is obviously a person using a mobility device, but also the mom pushing a stroller, the person recovering from knee surgery. That intervention has universal application, even though we think of it as only for some, it's really for all. Yes. When you and Ryan have your conversation, I would love for you to delve into this a little bit because Ryan's a varsity basketball player. And part of his challenge in these last four years has been navigating an athletic system that's really not built for him. Yeah, yeah. And he's done an amazing job advocating for himself, but he would really like to see more structural policy systemic change that would make it more accessible for other kids and easier for other kids like him. But in his conversations with his coach about the kinds of things that he needs, he's become very clear that those things that he needs would benefit every player on his team. And I think it's also he feels like the ticket to helping other people want to implement these changes. Because unfortunately, you know, people are not always wanting to shift for what they believe is like one or two people. But if they can start to get this idea that no, this is actually these changes can benefit everybody and make things more inclusive for everybody. I think that's part of where we'll get real change. Ryan is 100% right. You know, we've had an accommodation for some model, essentially since 1973, with got a special education and then the ADA in 1992. And the problem with an accommodation model is the concept of accommodation is kind of like the word tolerance. It kind of implies that we're doing something for those people that we don't really like all that much. So we need to go to an accommodation, not for some, accommodations for all approach. And when we can shift that, dynamic, we can build a broader coalition to Ryan's point. Because the reality is, look, I benefit from speech to text, text to speech technology, but so does the English language learner. So does somebody whose just preference as a learner is to listen opposed to read. And so when we say that there's accommodations only for those people over there, we continue to stigmatize those people. We continue to essentially mediate accommodation with pathology because we say, look, if you're going to be accommodated, something's got to be wrong with you, opposed to building a system in which we all have a right to be different. And we all have a right to engage with learning, engage with employment, engage with the built in environment in a way that's right for us without having to call our difference a deficiency inside of ourselves. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at the clock and thinking that the next two guideposts will have to do in a little bit more of lightning round fashion. Rapid, lightning round. I, I, got I love the depth in these first two guideposts, which I feel like were so important. But the next two guideposts are a lot about how to support you to be able to show up mindfully with your kids, to be able to make the impact that you have in the world. So I stands for invested in yourself and lightning round style would love to hear what have you learned you need for yourself to care for yourself to be able to get the things that you need to succeed what would you say are your highest level lessons around that you know i'm still i'm 45 years old (laughs) and i still wrestle daily with the voice that pops up and says you're stupid, crazy, lazy, and you're deficient. And I push that voice away now. I didn't usually. Back in the day, I believed it and struggled with a number of behavioral health and mental health challenges in my sort of early 20s because I didn't feel like I deserved help. I didn't deserve love. And that's deeply ingrained in being told that you're less than as a human being. So what I've learned is I do have a right to care myself, not to just give care, but to be cared for. And that's the most important lesson that I've learned. It's imperfect. You know, Uh I still don't at times feel that I have that right, but holding on to that is the path forward and asking for help, being able to ask for help. 
goes hand in hand with, with thinking you deserve help and have a right to support. And so those are the two things that I try to practice daily to care for myself. And it starts with believing that you have a right to be cared for and that you're worthy as a human being and that you're not less than. Yeah. I would love to go deeper there. So I'll send you a follow-up email because I want to know if you had any spark moments or transformational shifts that helped you learn that because this is definitely something that Ryan is still really grappling with. And maybe we can bring that into the conversation you have with him. The last guide post C is stands for connected and it's about being in community and in relationship on your journey so that you don't have to feel like you have to navigate this by yourself. Where have you found relationships and community to be supportive of you and your mission? Well, first, in formative part of my journey, I found connection and care, which are the prerequisite for community in a really unexpected spot. My father, I alluded to at the beginning of our chat, neurodivergent human being before there was any notion of neurodiversity or even learning and intentional differences. And I grew up thinking my father was really ashamed of me. And, you know, he would say things that were hurtful, you know, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? You know, why can't you be like everybody else? I won't have a retard in my family. And I really believed what he said and believed that he didn't care for me. You know, I learned much too late in my life that my father was ashamed, but he was more ashamed of himself. My father grew up in a very traditional Irish Catholic household. He went to a Catholic school and he had a nun growing up, no joke, named Sister Payne. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> like God had created this profession oh, for her and her alone. And, you know, she knew her way around a ruler. <laughs> wow. And my father had permanent scars on his knuckles. So there was a time when I was having a really hard time in school where I just left sixth grade and like dropped out of sixth grade. And me and my father went to a very famous baseball game, 88 World Series. And, and I don't even really remember the game. What I remember is afterwards being in the parking lot and there was terrible traffic. So we, we had to hang out there. And I was expecting a lecture from my dad. You know, I just left school, buck up, work harder. And my dad turns to me and goes, I love you regardless of how you do in school. And he goes, look, I love you for who you are. So I found connection and care there. And it's a reminder for all of us that we can be that person. It's hard, but it doesn't take a lot to communicate to somebody that you see them, you value you, them, you honor them, and you're there for them. And that's a call to action, I think, for all of us to be a part of that. I find community now with other folks with neurodiversities. Part of eye to eye was all about from the beginning at Brown University, creating community amongst people who felt like they shouldn't be at this Ivy League school, you know? Yeah. And I remember all those people like it was yesterday, it was six of us. And we lifted each other up. And we in community challenged, you know, that self doubt, we challenged that stigma that we shouldn't be there, that we should hide it, that we shouldn't tell people this was a part of who we were. And that connection with other folks, that neurodiversity community continues for me to this day to be a source of empowerment and a source of deep connection that keeps me going. Mm. One of the things I'm really appreciating about this powerful story about your dad is the importance for parents like myself and others to know that it's okay if we've made mistakes, because I've definitely made a lot of them, <laughs> but that we can learn and that our children can still take in a powerful message of love and acceptance at any point in our relationship. It's not too late to say. It's never too late. It's never too late. And I really do believe that human beings are so resilient that for 10 bad things, one outweighs them. And my father had many more than 10 on, him, on, his, on, his, on, his, on his list. But that one, and there were other moments like that, but that one in particular kind of wiped the slate clean. So it's never too late. And 
it's all about loving the people in your life, not for who they should be, but for who they really are and communicating that clearly. Well, that brings us to the part of the episode where you get to give me and anyone listening who also wants to say yes, a challenge that will help us to live our epic lives. And also, I think based on this conversation, help us to love and honor and accept the children in our lives, whether that's our own children or other children that we are advocating for. What would you like to see us do? You know, there's such social pressure to fake being normal, to pass as normal. That social pressure exists broadly and is systemic. The philosopher I admire named Michel Foucault wrote, the judges of normality are ever present everywhere. Mm. And so because of that pressure, if you have neurodiversity or are neurodivergent, you try to pass as normal. You fake it. And it does not work. And my journey of not just succeeding, but thriving, because there's a difference between those two. My journey of Mm. thriving started because somebody publicly wouldn't fake being normal. I remember the day clearly. I transferred to Brown University. I had gone to a university beforehand on soccer scholarship. All I thought I could be was a, a soccer player. I had a transformation in my sense of self, academically, not existentially, and transferred to Brown. And at transfer orientation, there was an icebreaker. We all had to go around the room, share where we transferred from and what we did the summer before. So the moment that started, it was like, let the brag fest begin. You know, it it was like, I transferred from Yale and I worked at the National Institute of Health or I transferred from Princeton and I worked at Goldman Sachs or I transferred from Harvard and I'm on a short list for a Nobel Prize, you know, like it was just like, and I remember literally being like, I'm going to leave this room and I'm going to call my mom and I'm going to go home because I have no place here and then the next guy goes he had purple hair he had bicycle chains around his wrists like they were bracelets and he said my name is david cole i transferred from landmark college which is a two-year college for people with learning and attentional differences and i worked construction last summer i'm like that's my boy right there (laughs) you know (laughs) He changed my life in that moment. Wow. You know, Dave Cole and I went off to write, co author Running Outside the Lines. Dave Cole and I went off to co found Eye to Eye. But all that aside, Dave Cole's courage to not fake normal changed my life. So, my challenge to everyone is to be like Dave Cole, to stop faking normal and celebrate every day in every person the power of different. Ooh, thank you. That seems like a beautiful segue to part two of your conversation on the Mother's Quest podcast, which I'm so thrilled about. So we will get that scheduled for Ryan to interview you about your book, Learning Outside the Lines, your experience as a neurodivergent student at university, which is going to be Ryan's reality come September. And I am certain that conversation is going to be a gift for so many other young people and their parents moving through this transition of high school to college. And it's going to be a gift. It's going to be a gift for me. I really, really look forward to that. And thank you so much for making space and time, not just for my contribution and story, but making space and time for the conversation around how we as a country can support empower parents and families because that's always mattered but let me tell you that matters more than ever nowadays well you brought us to the close which is always around acknowledgments and takeaways and you already shared some appreciation you have for the conversation i want to thank you for your commitment to helping us reframe the way in which you pay attention to language which i'm sure is one of your special gifts for your commitment to showing up fully as who you are. You know, I'm certain that you're the Dave Cole for so many students and young people who hear you speak. So thank you for 
using your voice and your life experience and your gift of storytelling in your books and in your speaking and in this podcast conversation today. It's been a great privilege and honor to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And if you're open, I would love it if you would close us out with a paragraph that was so powerful in your book, Normal Sex, on page six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's deeply personal because this book is a letter to my kids about living an authentic and purpose-driven life despite or around judges of normality. So here's the passage from it. I want you to be prepared. I want you to know how to live and thrive in a world that will at some point tell you, as it does all of us, that you're not normal because what you think, how you look, who you love, how you learn, how you feel, how you behave, or what you believe. I want you to know that normality is a problem to be struggled with, to be resisted, and ultimately an idea to be rejected and replaced. And I want you to know if those judges of normality wound you, like they have me and so many others, how to stitch yourself up and fight for a world that is not governed by those judges. When normal comes for you, I want you to be able to say what I couldn't when it came for me. Normal sucks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Looking forward to a lot more of your wisdom. Oh, thank you. I really, really appreciate your time and your show. Thank you so much for coming along with me on this episode of the Mother's Quest podcast. I hope this conversation sparked something that will help you live your epic life. If you'd like to get show notes and learn more about how to join the Mother's Quest community, visit mothersquest.com. And while you're there, I would love it if you would follow the prompts to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, and help us to spread the word. I want to end with some words to help light the way on your quest. Seize the day. Love your people. Honor your gifts. Until next time. Here to celebrate Jonathan Moody's accomplishments in life. Jonathan Mooney. I said that. You said Mooney. I said Mooney. You did? I did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wait, when are we recording? Oh, uh, we're recording he- now. I oh wait. Uh, okay, whatever. Looks like um. He- and make sure you watch this episode with your kid. And all the children are very grateful. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you very much. Um, it's not a watch because it's not a video. It's just a listen. Do you want to say? And make sure you listen to this episode with your Make kid. sure you listen to this episode with your kid. But also, I think she sh- my mom should make watchable episodes. Now, bye. <laughs> You're putting that in. <laughs>